Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending this, this webinar. And hello from Alicante. I noticed that one of the participants is from Alicante, I think Maria Teresa. So happy to, to have all you here today. And I hope you're fine and ready to, to start. Uh, today, we are going to focus on how to help the students to develop critical thinking, uh, include how to involve the students in an authentic learning experience. And in these sessions, uh, today we have the first session about critical thinking in, in CLIL. We're going to look at uh, what CLIL is, they're probably already familiar, and the benefits for, for learners, uh, what type of methodology uh, we are supposed to, to use, and also uh, how to structure a lesson, because most teachers are interested in, in knowing exactly uh, how to do a lesson based on, on CLIL, uh, how to deal with classroom management because it's essential when working with large classes and especially when we do clear that the students are going to work more collaboratively and cooperatively. Uh, what kind of activities we can do then, as we said before, to activate the, the, the learning and to develop learning uh, strategies and uh, assessment for learning opportunities. Today we are going to do a little bit, but not much, of theoretical side and we are going to focus on practical ideas in isolation because the idea is that in our next uh, webinar, in our next uh, session, to focus more on how to integrate everything in just one session. Okay? Uh, and any question that you have, please, okay, just uh, let, me, let me know. Okay, so first of all, what is CLEAL? Everybody know that CLEAL is uh, content and language integrated, integrated learning. With CLEAL, uh, we're focusing on language. Language is learned through CLEAL, and we use this language to build up subject knowledge, which is what we call content. And um, what are the benefits for those students who, you know, uh, study and they, they, they learn a subject through, through English? Well, one of these is motivation that um, the students are intrinsically motivated because we are not focusing on the language, we are using the language for, for learning. So this, in a way, uh, help a student to make a kind of, of progress because we are focusing on, on the content, not on the language. Uh, the students are going also to develop cognitively. That is to say, here the students are just going to develop different thinking skills, uh, cognitive strategies, uh, they go into, you know, through the process that the brains uh, go, go through different strategies. They're going to develop communication skills because they need a language to communicate facts, to communicate what the content that they, they, they learn. And we are going to integrate all the language skills. We are not going to work them on, you know, as we said before, uh, separately. Uh, so here we are going to connect both the language skills that they need for communication and the kind of say thinking skills that they also need to acquire the content. When we think about um, cognitive skills, we mean, for example, remembering, identifying, ordering, ranking, classifying, predicting, hypothesizing, creating. So that is the idea of all the thinking skills that you have to develop. And of course, they receive a lot of input, and, and, and this helps them work more effectively because uh, input alone is not enough. And as the input goes along with different type of activities, uh, we know that we receive the input when we hear, when we, when we listen, but we have to integrate this in a context. And the context is the, the content that the students are uh, acquiring that they are they are learning so they are actively uh, engaged as we said before in the in the learning process and they interact meaningfully. What we understand by this, you know, the students are going to work mainly uh, not just uh, as a whole group, as a whole class, but they, we're going to have different type of interactions and language and communication becomes more meaningfully when the students, for example, they work in pairs in the small groups, they're going to provide different group dynamics and different type of interaction 
where communication uh, is somehow meaningful for, for them. Um, it's much more effective, so it's about uh, the focus on communication, about the, the meaning of what they are, they are learning. And, of course, to develop intercultural inter awareness. Uh, why is this important? Because the students probably will have the opportunity to work with uh, students from another country, to be involved in a project work, or even to know through the language about the culture and the, the, the text, the content that, the content that they're learning, um, and some different cultural aspects. So when they learn about other cultures, they also they start comparing about their own culture. And in this way, they develop this intercultural awareness. Um, that is an enriching experience for, for the students, um, because they can just start comparing. And of course, it's good for, clearly for the students in the way that they learn in different ways. We all know that. And the students have different learning styles that we're going to see later. And we need to provide them with different type of activities uh, to exploit, to exploit this, and clearly it's a good opportunity uh, to do it. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, let me let me know. So these are the main benefits for learners when uh, dealing with with CLIL. Now, in CLIL, there are four C's that probably you're familiar with. Just go through these briefly. We talk about culture, we talk about content, communication, and cognition. But the culture, as I say, is associated with the language, language and culture go together, and also about the context and the content in which it takes place. And as I explained to you before, uh, about any connection or any, you know, um, activities that they do with any other students, other students from different schools. About the content is the subject area that we are teaching. Communication, we know that the kind of skills that the students need in order to be able to uh, produce language, to use the language for, for learning uh, about the, the context, for example. Um, and here we have just to think about the importance of providing the students with more opportunity for SDT. I don't know if you have heard about SDT, student talking time, more than TTT, that is teacher talking time. In a more traditional way of teaching, we are always focusing uh, or doing a teacher-centered. So here the idea is like the students use the language, the students use different strategies and develop different strategies for communication. And the last C is cognition that I explained to you before. The students are going to develop different thinking skills, as I mentioned to you um, before. So when thinking about CLIL, we need to know exactly what type of methodology to use. We are all the time talking about language and content, and we're going to talking about communication. So first, we need just to think about a methodology that is communicative, that is to say, allow students, as I said to you before, for a more uh, student talking time, and uh, doing activities in which the students are going to interact, they have information gap activities, they can choose the language they need to uh, communicate the, the knowledge, the subject knowledge that they are acquiring. Uh, cooperative, because we are going to provide the students with opportunities to uh, work together, assigning roles, that the students think about the abilities and the skills that they have to make some kind of contribution to the learning. Um, for example, if they're working on a particular task, to see exactly uh, that everybody is able to collaborate. So working cooperatively is, is a good way uh, for the students to be more engaged in the, in the activities the students are going to, to share ideas and, as I said to you, to contribute somehow. Uh, constructivism, because you always need to provide students uh, with different tools, different strategies for them to construct their own knowledge. The students have to learn by doing. If they learn by doing, they're going to learn by experimenting, by exploring, by discovering. So they're going to be intrinsically motivated. They're going to be engaged. And this leads us into the play-based learning. 
the students, when we think about place-based learning, uh, place-based learning provides a natural context that stimulates students' imagination, creativity, the students that are going to be, as I said to you before, actively engaged in their own learning process. We can do drama activities, we can do storytelling, we can do games, we can do songs. So we are focusing on context, subject, knowledge that the students have just to acquire, but we can do it in many different ways. So not just only focusing on a text, uh, just reading or just only listening. We can get the students to do some speaking through, through um, for example, uh, drama activity at the same time that they are doing a speaking and learning, for example, about the water cycle. Um, and learner centered, as I said to you before, providing opportunities for the students to spend most of the time using the language. Everything that we do in class revolves around the student and the material, the type of methodology. So we need to focus on what the students need and why learner centers, because we're always thinking about a mixed ability class. So we have to think about the different um, levels and learning styles that our students here have. I, I know that sometimes it's not that uh, easy, you know, to take, uh, but at least having this in mind uh, will be easy for us, you know, just to start planning our lessons based on CLIL. And we can just carry out a project work when thinking um, about uh, a lesson, uh, like for example, that uh, why projects work because it's ideal for mixed ability classes, different levels, different learning styles, the students become more autonomous, we can connect these with the way that the students can work cooperatively. And it's just ideal for the students to develop uh, social skills, uh, to take initiative of their own work. So in this way, the students are becoming more autonomous learners. And there are different kind of projects that we, you will see in the following, in the following session. Um, now, we know about the methodology that we can adopt, the different methods and approaches, so we know that our methodology is going to be eclectic because we're going to uh, focus on different methods and approaches, different theories to get a strategies to help our students develop their critical thinking. But at the same time, we have to think about how students think and learn. In this case, we are focusing on a holistic way about our students' multiple intelligences. I'm quite sure everybody is familiar with. Emotional intelligence. Most of the students, most of the time, students will be working in uh, in groups, as I said before, or in pairs. So students need to learn how to negotiate, how to take initiative, how to respect each other. I mean, all the uh, social, let's say, um, values and, and that they need just to to build up. Uh, how to manage, for example, their emotions, um, how to, well, um, recognize their own strengths and weaknesses. And as I said before, the kind of contribution they can make uh, to the learning that they are doing cooperatively. And of course, the learning style. So everything is integrated, uh, multiple intelligence, emotional intelligence, learning styles, everything's kind of embedded, you know and within the kind of methodology that we are going to use with our students. And this is just basically for you to know that uh, when we think about CLIL, CLIL is an umbrella term. That is to say, um, it includes several ways of teaching. And we're going to get a little bit from here, a little bit from, from there, in which content is learned by using a foreign language. So by having an eclectic approach methodology, it would be much easier uh, to appeal to all that our, our students our students need. Now, another key concept that we can see here is scaffolding. Well, you have heard about scaffolding uh, to make language and content easier for our students. So when we provide them with an activity, how or a task, how we can get students be involved in the activity, how we can easy the way for the students to be able to work autonomously on the on the task. So the scaffolding is breaking up the activity in different in different steps, like chunks of language or the learning into chunks. 
so in this way, uh, providing a tool or a structure with each with each tank. We will see later how we can just do some, some scaffolding. We can do scaffolding when students do reading, for example, using different reading strategies, focusing on skimming, the scanning, uh, introducing or pre-teaching vocabulary that the students will need first in order to be able to read the text independently. Um, and cognitive skills, that is part of the critical thinking that the students have to, to develop. I mentioned this um, thinking skills or cognitive skills um, before. Um, for example, how to teach critical thinking skills in an inquiry-based uh, learning. We all know that children are a little bit or naturally curious and begin to ask why. The little ones, for example, when you teach six, seven year old students. So from a very young age, they are a little bit curious. So we can use, for example, that very simple mystery hat, the woods and the mystery hat. We can just put here different items for the students to, uh, to guess what inside. So this is a thinking skill. We ask uh, or we encourage the rest of the class to uh, ask questions. Here comes the chunks of language that we teach the students. So we ask the volunteer to come out to the front. And we said, OK, the rest of the class asked, is it big? Is it soft? Does it feel cold or hard? So what do you think? So we ask the student, the, the, the child touching, what do you think it is and why? Well, I think, and this is a chunk of language, I think it's an apple because it is hard and round. And yes, it's an apple, all right? So in a very simple way, we are encouraging students just to start developing critical thinking because this type of activity, uh, thinking activity, engages all ages and all level. And then we have uh, categorizing, for example. Let me give you an example. And here we have, if you have any question, please let me know. Here we have, we have an apple that I showed to you before. And what is an apple? An apple is as a fruit and it is hard and it's round. We say, okay, what can you see here? For example, it's spinach. And here we have, for example, a potato, and we have a carrot. We are eliciting from the students. We are activating vocabulary. The students are already familiar with this. For example, uh, asparagus. And um, we have here funny cauliflower. So the idea is that giving the students all these different items, okay, we encourage the students, for example, to create a plant. How can they create a plant? So we are giving the students time to think. And I'm going to explain to you why. So the idea is that a student, so what do you think comes first? What do you think comes first? First, for example, a carrot. Do we want to make a plant? So here we have the carrot and then comes, for example, the asparagus, okay, are you getting an idea? So we are just making a plant and here we have, for example, a cauliflower, okay, and then we keep like with the lettuce and we have a P that we put it here. So at the end, what do we have? We have, and for example, a banana. So we encourage the students to make this plant. Is it a real plant? It's not a real plant. And then we start, we start comparing. This is a real plant. This is what a real plant looks like. 
But here we have an imaginary plant. The idea is to give the students the little pieces so they can use the imagination to think how they can put all these little pieces, the different fruits and vegetables, to make a plant. This is creativity. This is developing their thinking skills. And then we compare. All right? So here we start the carrot, the roots of the plant, asparagus, the stem, and then we have the banana, the fruit, the cauliflower, the flower of the plant, the pea, the seed, the lettuce that we have here, the leaves, and so on. What are we doing? We are getting the students to think, and we are introducing the new content, that is to say, the new vocabulary, vocabulary that we need. And one of the activities that we're going to do later is, for example, to categorize, to classify. So if you're thinking about the root, okay, then we are going to divide the students into groups. Each group will have just one basket with roots, and we have to move around the classroom trying to find fruits or vegetables that are the roots of the plant. The same with seeds, for example. Okay, so this is categorizing, and it's also an important aspect of problem solving. All right, and we encourage the whole class to look at all this to collect around the classroom, good for the kinesthetic students that we mentioned before, the uh, multiple intelligence. So this is a very simple activity that we can do. And then we ask the students in group to say, okay, uh, we have that chunk of language. Uh, for example, potato, sweet potato, uh, carrot, we have corn, we have peas, and so on, all right? This chunk of language that I mentioned to you before, and while doing this, uh, then the students are going to label the plants. All these are different strategies, learning strategies that the students are using that probably are familiar with, all right? So, uh, once we have introduced this uh, to the students, for example, uh, and we want to give the students further practice about, you know, uh, the content that we are introducing little by little. We can have here just a nice picture. Uh, this is Cookie Master. Cookie Master, everybody knows that loves eating cookies. And here we have Cookie Master not eating cookies, but eating healthy food, fruit and vegetables, because we are talking about plants. So it's very important to try to connect with things that are uh, or characters or uh, a context that the students are familiar with. And in this case, we already have, is this a real plant or an imaginary plant? It's an imaginary plant. Okay, look at Cookie Master. When Cookie Master eats um, carrots, what part of the plant is he eating? He's eating, and we are listed from the students, the root. When Cookie Master eats Corn, what part of the plant is he eating? He's eating seeds. So you know what I mean? Like we are repeating the same structure. So the language is easy for the students. Of course, that before organizing the activity, we have to think, okay, what is the aim? What language skill we want to practice? What cognitive skills we want to develop? And um, the type of, I mean, chunks of language that the students need for communication, all right, to learn and to acquire subject knowledge, but this is what I mentioned to you before. But as students um, are actively uh, participating all the time, they are intrinsically motivated. Now, if we have here, for example, have just another little board, just for you to know. Okay. For example, well, you're familiar with this. What is this? This is three in a row, or tic-tac-toe, or no sign crosses. It's a simple activity, as you can see, that requires kids to use their critical thinking because they're going to use logical reasoning skills. We divide the students into two big groups. 
and we say group one you are circles group two you are crosses so by doing this what we are going to do is to say asking questions when cookie monster eats carrots what part of the plant is he eating group one okay for example it's saying root if the answer is correct then come to the front and they decide where to make the circle all right so uh, for example here and they continue like this when cookie monster eats leaves what part of the plant is he eating Le um, sorry lettuce leaves okay and they are doing the tic-tac-toe of three in a row all right this activity stimulates the kids uh, brains and gives them something exciting to do they know how to play so you don't have to spend time explaining they're using the language uh, they can use like chunks of, of language now uh, for more cognitive skills, for example, that the students have just to develop and for kinesthetic students, most of the time, okay, uh, we're all the time saying, for example, we eat uh, lettuce, we eat leaves. So, imagine first grade, all right, or depending on the level your students. We give the students work cards like this. We eat to challenge the students a little bit more, we write when Cookie Master eats Lee, uh, sorry, carrot. What part of the plant is he? So when Cookie Master eats carrot, he eats the root of the plant. So depending on the level of the students, you use different. The idea is like a student have to stand out uh, just in a line in front of the of the classroom and try to put themselves in order. So the first one is we, and then is it, and then is seed. Uh, to make it more challenging, the students stand, they come out to the front, and they don't show the piece of paper. So uh, one starts saying, for example, it, and the other said we, and the other said seed. So the rest of the class, without showing it, have to remember the words that the students have said and try to put them in order. It's what we do with sentences, for example. So then, Maria, uh, we, um, Claudia, eat, and then the last student sits, so we eat seeds. It's a very simple activity. Um, if you have any questions, please, or if I'm going too fast, please let me know. Uh, what can you see here? We have here red, and we have a yellow circle, and we have a green circle. What it looks like a traffic light. So the idea is for those visual students that they start completing sentences. So what they remember about that we it. Sit. Okay, so then we have we, oops, sorry, with a, it, we, it, sit. So then we said we, it, lettuce. And the students have just to change only the green one and the substitute. This is another uh, strategy that the students are developing, all right? And we're focusing on the content because the students are learning that we eat seeds, that we eat leaves, that we eat flowers, that are all parts of a plant. And very simple. So there the students can start seeing the written word, and then they will be able to write. But before we get the students to write, depending on the student's height, it's a very simple activity, we use this so the students know exactly, like color-coded activity, to know exactly where, you know, to put the the words, right? Very simple activity just to do with, with the students. And this is more or less kind of uh, doing it in a way, as you can see, we are working on chunk of language, we are working on uh, some cognitive skills and um, 
activating vocabulary because we're going to get the students to label, to categorize. Uh, so when teaching uh, vocabulary, we need to activate it. And this is important that we do different activities uh, that teach the meaning and give the students the opportunity to learn and memorize. But what happens if we do only that, that the students they learn and they memorize? You are familiar with the high order thinking skills. If we get the students only to remember, to learn, to memorize, they're just listening, uh, using a little bit of their brain. So focusing on Blue's taxonomy, high order thinking skills, we are going to work on the low order thinking skills, but also we are going to move on to the high order thinking skills. Because we want the students, yes, to remember, to understand, and to be able to apply but at the very end, when they are learning the subject knowledge, using the language for this learning, they have to be able to evaluate and to create. All right? So in this way, uh, we are just uh, fostering the development of these uh, thinking skills. Now, class and management is so important in CLIL. Um, for group dynamics and also to know exactly what is the role of the teacher. For group dynamics, what kind of activities can we do with our students in order to be able to, um, to group them, that they can just interact and to carry out meaningful interaction that we mentioned before. So I just here I'm going to mention some strategies that you can start using with your students. It's not just thinking about what content to teach, what chunk of language just they need in order to be able to understand but what uh, strategies I'm going to use to manage uh, the classroom uh, and to facilitate group dynamics. So one of the activities I do is I use lollipop sticks, as you can see here. Okay? So I ask the students to write their name, for example, Javi or Victoria, and the idea is that uh, probably you have experienced this, that you always um, that you always have the same, let's say, uh, people participating, the same students, right? And you have other students who are more reluctant and they feel embarrassed. So, using this technique, the lollipop sticks, you can say, Javi, it's your turn, all right, just to answer. Or now, let's see, for example, Maria, it's your turn to answer, to do this, to do that. All right, so you keep a good group dynamic in this way and everybody uh, participates. Sometimes I do it on purpose and I just, you know, read the name because I want that particular student to participate a little bit more. Then uh, we have traffic light. I don't have the other cups here, but I use these cups, something like this, okay? And you have green and you have another one that is red and you have one that is yellow. When we do CLEAL, we focus more on tasks. So you foster more autonomous learning by getting the students to cooperate and do some group activity. What happens that you have a large class and how to manage large classes? If you give a set of these cups to each group, the students have to be uh, ready to use them, for example, placing the green one on their desks. So we know as teachers that the students understand everything, that they are working perfectly well. We don't have to worry about anything. We can keep monitoring the class. But if the students, instead of using this, they put a yellow one, it means that they are working, they understand that something is not clear, and we, want, we have to go there, you know, just to uh, help them for any Thing they need. If they have the red one, it means that they don't have really a clue of what you know just to to do, or they got they, they got a stack. All right. So uh, like this, there are different type of uh, activities that we can we can do. Another one, for example, is uh, by doing by using this uh, colored sticky note. So you display this sticky note. You can you have to do it before. Uh, class is starting your, your lesson and you put different sticky uh, notes uh, around the classroom on the students' desks. So when the students get there, they can see 
they're sticking out and probably they have to find all the others who are purple, all the others who are yellow or green or red. So this way we are grouping the students. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, different, uh, for example, uh, you're working on animals, you can write animals on each um, sticky note and then you have to find animals and doing a mingle activity. Uh, I live in the ocean, where do you live? So I'm a shark and you, I'm a crab. So when all the ocean, all the animals that live in the ocean get together, all the animals that live in the desert get together and we keep in this, in this way. This is a way of grouping uh, a student. And then we have onion groups. This, I know, is a funny name, all right, just to, to group of students. But the idea is, like, students work on, on, on a specific or specific task, and you group them, uh, just three or four students in each, in each group. And when you give the, the signal, one of the students, one member of the, of the group uh, will become the peeler, that is, you know, like, peels off and goes to join uh, another group where information is exchanged. So this is good for those students whose level is higher. Um, they need a little bit more of a challenge. So you have different levels in a class. So everybody, for example, is working on habitat. Each group is working on different habitat. For example, desert, ocean, forest, and jungle. So one of the pillars will go and join another group and start exchanging information. So at the very end, that a student would come to his or her group and retell everything that he remembers from the different habitats. And the other students will be taking notes. So this is for when you have different levels in class and you're working with different texts. So everybody works, I mean, just uh, four groups, four different uh, texts and they get different uh, information. And we have the autograph book. That in this case, the autograph book, uh, the idea is that at the end of the term, uh, the students know exactly uh, with how many students they've been working. For example, they can have a notebook in which they're going to, when they finish the task or the activity or the project, to get the other students to sign in their notebook. Uh, so at the very end of the term, they can see with how many students they've been working. And our role as teachers, as we said before, is going to be mainly um, presenter, explainer, or we can see here monitor, but always giving the students opportunity for more uh, talking time and uh, more independent, independent work. Okay, having said this about class management, we need to know how to structure LS. It's going to be task-based. So first, we're going to divide always in three main stages, a pre-task activity, a task uh, cycle, and then we are going to work on a kind of feedback that we're going to do at the very, at the very end. As you can see, in the pre-task, we're going to introduce a topic, uh, but we're going to do activities of the one that I show you, for example, before, right? Get me students try to start thinking, um, preparing for the task, pre-teaching any vocabulary, introducing any chunk of language that the students will need for any reading or any task they're going to do. Then the task itself, the students during the task cycle, we see like three main parts, task, planning, and report. That is when the students are going to work mainly on, on the task and then they're going to plan, for example, how to report it when doing some uh, recent work or they have to make some presentation, oral presentation, how to report it back to, to the class. They can record, they can do different strategies um, for them just to then present it to, to the class. The idea is that they can even uh, do mini talks, so we divide uh, the students into, into groups and they become like uh, teachers and then they move around the classroom and they have to explain to each other uh, about um, their animal, their plant or whatever topic you are focusing uh, on. And about the, um, the feedback is then when we focus on any specific language that the students may need, we get the students to reflect, to assess themselves and this one starts uh, analyzing what 
um, you know, what the students really need to keep improving the, the, the language skills and the language, the language areas. All right, so we need to conduct different activities to build the students' confidence in, in, using, in using the language. I know if I'm going too fast. Um, and, of course, once we have all this in, in mind, we need to think about what type of practical ideas we can use uh, for developing learning strategies. When we think about uh, a clear session, we know that there are three main stages, the main task that we are going to do, but then how we are going to give the new information to the students, how we are going to teach and activate vocabulary, how we are going to guide understanding. That's very important. I'm moving on to the next uh, slide so you can see all the other activities. What type of activities we can do to focus on the speaking, to focus on writing, what type of project work we can do and how we're going to consolidate. Consolidation is important in that feedback uh, stage that I mentioned to you before when the students are going to reflect and we're going to analyze the language they need. So going back to giving new information, how we're going to give new information. There are different here, different activities. Uh, for example, one of the, I cannot explain all of them. I will be explaining everything, just more practical ideas in our following. Uh, a session is um, how to deal with, for example, cooperative listening in order for the students to take notes and when we have to give new information. Imagine that we have to give a students new information, going back to plants, and we can divide the students into pairs. So we're going to say A, B, I, B, I, B, and they said, okay, A, raise your hand. A, listen carefully. B, write carefully. So we're given assigning a task. And we start saying, for example, or aloud, a plant needs sand and water to make food. So then A will listen carefully and B will start taking notes. Uh, a plant has roots in the soil. That will be part of information. Uh, plants drink water to stay alive. So we say or we give them pieces of information about plants and we stop. And then we ask A to tell B what he or she remembers about what we said. And B has to check his or her notes to see if what A is saying is right or not. Okay, so this is a very simple. And then we swap roles. So this is cooperative listening. The students are going to take note. It is also a thinking uh, a strategy for the students just to, to develop. Okay. Um, yes, let me... Okay, here we have, for example, um, as we can see a text that I say to you, where the students, for example, are going to learn about what plants need and the different parts of the, of the plant. So we are going to ask the students to scan the text. How we can do that? We prepare beforehand, okay, like slips of paper, all right, with sentences in which uh, they're part of the, of the text. That they're, and we ask volunteers from each group to come out to the front. They are going to read the slip of paper and then they have to remember, go back to their team and just say the sentence aloud to see how much they remember. The rest of the, the group have to try to find the sentence in the text. So in this way, we are scanning the, uh, we're scanning the, the text. Okay, this is one of the activities that we can, that we can do. Or uh, just to activate vocabulary, the students go through the the text, they go through the, the poem in this case, and they have to choose a word. So we ask all the students to stand up. Probably I will ask you to or I will ask you to encourage you to say to your students, okay, write down the word that you have chosen, just in case. So then we start uh, calling out words from the text. And on the board we write write and uh, wrong. 
So we start saying, for example, sun. If nobody has chosen sun, then I put it in the wrong column. Uh, if I say, for example, water, and there are two or three children who have chosen uh, water, they sit down. And we keep like this. So the last student to remain standing is the kind of winner because we were, we, we were not able to guess his or her word. All right? It's a nice activity for the students just to, to focus on uh, some uh, words from, from a text, uh, for example. To uh, guide understanding, uh, very important to use different type of graphic organizers. Um, I will be, for the next session, providing you with a handout with all the activities explained. And then I will be developing a whole session with the three main stages and the task and the type of activities, how to get started. I will give you all this material. So, for example, here, I don't know if you can see it clearly, we have like three columns. So before getting started to guide understanding, we are going to encourage the students to write down what they know, so what they're familiar with, the previous knowledge. So for example, about plants, what they know about plants. And the second column that we have a W is what I want to know. So what I'm interested in, just focusing on the student's interest. And at the end of the process, when we finished what I learned. So this is part of the reflection that the students will go through. They were going to reflect on what they, they learn. There are different graphic organizers that we can use. Uh, for example, here's the topic, if it is about food, habitat, solar system, whatever. And here, imagine they have animals, okay, mammals, reptiles, and then every all the characteristics in the description. So this is very visual for the students once we have activated the vocabulary so them to remember just the, the word, how to organize their ideas, or even this can be used later for uh, a writing activity. This is another type of graphic organizer that I use with my students, that is kind of vocabulary in which students are going to write the word. Uh, they're going to choose six words, because sometimes it's quite hard for the students to remember everything. So what are the words that you like the most? And then to write the word, to draw a picture, depending on the student's age, to use dictionaries, uh, to look for, you know, the meaning in a dictionary that connects with, with the topics. Uh, this graphic organizers, all of them, is from a book, it's a pity that I don't have it here, uh, from Scholastic, and it's called A Big Book of Organizers. But I can provide you with this, with this material. Uh, here I have another one. I, I love using this kind of mind map, what's the main idea? So once the students have been reading a text, they put here the main idea of the text, and then everything, you know, here in the spine, you know, the main ideas, and then all the supporting details along the afterbones. All right? I know if it is quite clear. Okay? And of course, that you're familiar with, with Venn diagrams. All right, for example, the difference between living and non-living things, what they have in common. You can do this one activity to make it more practical for the students, more visual. When we're doing Venn diagram, I use a rope. And I use two ropes, so I make two big circles on the floor. And then I use labels. So we are categorizing, we are talking, for example, about uh, different animals, whatever topics that you, that you are dealing with and you want to focus on a Venn diagram. So you put the ropes on the floor pretending to be a Venn diagram and then um, the headings and the students have to use, for example, a mammal has got, a reptile has got, so using chunks of language again, describing the animal and then what they have in common. So I do this before getting a student to work individually or in pairs completing the worksheet. So this is more visual, more kinesthetic for, for the students, and they're categorizing and they're visualizing a little bit more. Um, okay, uh, let me pick just going on a little bit. And there are a lot of activities that we need to, to carry out, and we have only a couple of minutes left, I'm afraid. Um, here, as I said, focusing on 
uh, speaking, focusing on, on writing, how to do project work. Uh, for example, for speaking and connects with um, vocabulary, we do, for example, hot seat. Are you familiar with hot seat? The idea is that you write, for example, the word, imagine on the board, the word snake, okay? Um, before writing the word on the board, you ask the volunteer to come out to the front. He or she sits on a chair, that's a hot seat, and uh, that child is facing the class. So, uh, we write the, the word up on the board, and the students have to give him her um, description, but without using the word. So, for example, uh, it hasn't got any legs. And it's a reptile. And, okay, they said that the child on the hot seat has to say snake. So we're going to give them a time limit. So depending, you have one minute, how many words that student can guess in one minute and point for their, for their team, all right? And um, what else that we can do that uh, we have, for example, that's the, the hot seat, we can do a kind of bingo activity that is for listening and also we can encourage students just to uh, do some reading and, and speaking as, as well, uh, understanding and, and defining, listening and speaking. So we can give the students a, a greet and they're going to complete with any of the words that they want from the text that we have read or the vocabulary we have introduced. So we start reading out definitions so we can ask a volunteer to take one slip of paper with a definition, to read it aloud, and the other still have to listen and try to find the, uh, the word that matches that uh, definition. Uh, this would be for a kind of bingo uh, activity. And then we, we had, for example, a kind of, of uh, graffiti. I know if I just put it here. Um, a graffiti that in this case uh, we are all going to work on reasoning, giving opinion, evaluating, identifying. So we're going to use different uh, cognitive uh, skills. The main skills would be speaking and writing, that is what we are focusing uh, on. And the idea is that, for example, we uh, divide the students into groups and we give each uh, learner, for example, a number in, in the group from one to four. So one, two, three, and four. And this is to ensure that every student will participate in, in the activity. Um, but they will not know exactly the rule for their number until later. So we're not going to explain this to, to them yet. We give each group uh, a color name, for example, red, blue, black, green, and we're going to give them a marker of that uh, color. So the group will keep that marker and we are going to display different posters uh, and topic around the classroom. The idea is that the students are going to move around the classroom uh, answering questions about the poster that they, they have. So they're going just to uh, write, for example, they're going to imagine. So as an example, they, go, they see a poster, they have some question next to it, and on a piece of paper that also have, they're going to write uh, a question. But that would be, for example, number two turns to, to write, okay, the answer. Once they've been moving and they've been, you know, to all the posters, when they uh, get back to where they had started, they are going to uh, make a kind of presentation using the information from the questions that everybody has been, you know, uh, uh, written. Uh, they're going to make a presentation. So this here we are focusing on, on writing and, and speaking. So we have a poster, we have questions that we prepared so the students look at the picture and try just to read uh, the questions and try to answer that everybody is taking is taking turn. I don't know if it's quite clear this, this activity, just let me know. It's called graffiti, we call it graffiti activities. So as you can see there are many activities as we we can do, but whenever we plan a lesson, we have to think about three main stages, and we're going to use different activities depending on the goal that we have, what the learning outcomes will be that we are expecting, what language skills and language areas we need to practice, chunks of language, so we're going to 
get the activities in order to develop a whole lesson. In our following session, we are going just to put all this in a real lesson. So now you have some uh, ideas about what to take into account in, in, in Quill and all the elements, all the, the components. And it's just organizing activities and thinking about the, what the main task is of what we are, of we are teaching. Um, and um, I'm afraid to run out of, of, of time just to, to think that uh, we need to think about the way we are going to assess our, our students, such for example, to provide them for learning uh, opportunities, and what type of, we're going mainly to focus on uh, formative uh, assessment, that's three, for example, types of probation, we're going to carry out some rubric, and uh, what else can can we do? Pair, you know, peer assessment, and even when they are doing some speaking, then the students have just to, uh, for example, make some comments about the performance of the other students. This will depend, of course, on the students, on the students' um, age and, and level. And it's important to do some conferencing with the student that is uh, five minutes. Uh, after the you know the class or during the class to be able just to um, um, you know well I'm being told that um, we have extra time I think I'm not quite sure just I'm going to to ask any questions so far that you you have probably I've been running so fast because uh, just let me know what questions do you do you do you have and We'd like to, to answer to you, right? If you want, we can go back to the activities that we have. Just let me go back a little bit. Uh, as I was saying, um, you can just have, um, you can use some storytelling, especially with primary school uh, children. You can use some activities uh, like drama, like storytelling, and um, somebody was asking me for more examples about, um, I don't know, mutual dictation, for example. Someone was asking for uh, mutual dictation. So here is when we give the students information uh, about any of the content we are working on. Uh, we divide the students into pairs, and we are going to give each student the same text but some of the sentences are missing. So for example, A, we have certain sentences that B doesn't have. So then they are going to start um, dictating to each other. For example, as I said, going back to this example, so for you to, to know, imagine one student has this, but only some students, some sentences have been removed and the other student have the other part. So it's a kind of information gap activity. So they're going to dictate. This is good for speaking. This is good for uh, writing, for, for reading. OK? And we have other activities. Uh, sorry, could you send us a worksheet? Of course, yes. I can just um, send you just some, some activities. Um, said some of these activity words need to be looked up for further explanation. What do you mean exactly, Maria? Luis, I don't understand uh, your comment. Um, of course, I can send you the, the worksheet with all the, the activities and the graphic organizers. That would be that would be fine. I have all of them. Um, well, I don't have any any web page with all the activities, but I will be very glad to to send them all in to Oxford, you know, just to prepare a handout with all the activities and send it to, to you. So uh, about uh, a whole unit or summary, uh, integrating and its timing. Sometimes it's quite difficult just to think about just one lesson thinking about the timing and the content because probably you may find but it doesn't fit your own needs and your own um, because the age of the students you are teaching. 
But this is what we are going to work in our next session, that is to say how to integrate all the activities and how to manage the time. So you know exactly how to start pre-teaching, how to work on the task and the content and what other activities to, to do it. Um, as I said, Lola, I will be sending all this, these activities. I've been, I started teaching uh, CLEAL 25 years ago, so all these kind of activities that I do is mainly uh, from, you know, teaching experience and also you put into practice, you know, what it was and what doesn't, doesn't work. And there are lots of material uh, available for, uh, it. Oxford has a lot of uh, books and resources material for teachers where you can get some, some ideas as well. I know that the most difficult part is, is assessment. Um, about uh, advice that we can, can give is, um, just to have a kind of collection of all the, the work that the, student, uh, that the students have. I don't have it right now, is the kind of rubric that the students can just uh, do, you know, um, I don't have it right now because that's to show it to you, but I can show it to you next, next time. Um, so let me know if you have any other doubt, any other thing that I can just, you know, think about for our next, next session. Um, uh, how long does it take to work uh, one unit approximately? Well, I think I would say that more or less about four or six sessions depending on, on the students. But I would suggest that uh, we have another session yet in, in February. So it would depend on the students and the age of the students, you know. Uh, mainly we suggest, as I said at the beginning, clearly it's an umbrella term, so we can carry out project work. But what are ideal for, you know, teaching primary school children for many reasons. And then you can carry out a project work and through the project work that I will be doing that next time. Uh, from the projects, you can divide it into different sessions. And the idea of the project, they have a, a product at the end um, of, the, of their work. Um, uh, where can you find clear resources? Uh, well... There are not really many books about CLEAL where we can take our ideas, but I then, you know, um, I will just be thinking about what type of website that you can you can visit, and there are a lot of material that I use. To be honest, I use a lot of material, resource material from, from Oxford that I, I use ideas, but also uh, I just like the graphic organizers and all this. I use material that I've been observing classes of Lori and then I said, okay, this material can be adapted and can get some ideas from the different uh, observations that I've been, I've been doing different. The next session is in February, mm -hmm, on the 18th, uh, on 14th, I think. Uh, so what we are going to do next time is just to put all this into practice and I'm going to prepare just one session with assessment included. Uh, so you may have a clear picture of what a clear session looks like and how just to develop a set of um, a set of sessions that connects each other. Okay. Um, I hope you find this uh, interesting. Let me know if you have you know any other suggestions 